Have you ever wondered how to exercise safely throughout your pregnancy? Or how your exercise should be different from your first to your second to your third trimester? Or how you can avoid and alleviate hip, knee, and back pain? Today you're going to find out how you can stay fit during pregnancy and lose the baby fat quickly afterwards. Today you're going to meet Amy Hughes. After Amy experienced pain and frustration during her first pregnancy, she developed a program with a pelvic floor therapist and her own knowledge as a personal trainer to help hundreds of women navigate their pregnancy more smoothly. You're listening to the Best You Podcast, where we help goal setters improve all six areas of life, health, personal, career, financial, spiritual, and relational, because we believe getting closer to your best you takes a well-rounded approach. My name is Nick Carrier, an entrepreneur, fitness trainer, and motivational speaker. And I was going down the traditional path of working a nine to five until my high school personal trainer saw something in me. I quit my job and started my own business. My mission is to help you gain clarity on who the best version of yourself is and how to become that person. Amy experienced pain and frustration during her first pregnancy, but as a personal trainer, she was determined to come up with a solution. She was determined to come up with exercises and stretches and a program so that during her next pregnancy, she didn't experience the same pain and frustration. In this episode, we'll find out how to exercise safely throughout pregnancy, what to do and what not to do, and how that differs during each trimester, what exercises to relieve and eliminate back pain, and how to bounce back quickly after giving birth. For now, it's time. It's time to learn how to safely exercise throughout pregnancy with the one and only Amy Hughes. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast today. I'm super excited to be, jo- to be joined by the one and only Amy Hughes. Amy, just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Of course. So today is going to be very much dedicated and pointed to exercise while being pregnant and how to make sure that we exercise safely in a way that we are not in, in, in pain and we are out able to come on the other side of pregnancy um, as strong and as healthy as possible. Um, but the way I want to start today, Amy, is just kind of diving a little bit into your story. You told me uh, before we hopped on here real quick that you have a 19-month-old daughter. You're pregnant with your second on the way in the second trimester. And you have created recently this program called the Pregnancy Protocol. What led you to wanting to create this program? Was it kind of like the experience that you had with your first pregnancy? Or tell me more about that. Yeah. So my husband is a coach with ATG as well. And he really set me up well for my first pregnancy. And going into pregnancy, I thought, okay, I want to be in the best shape of my life because learning a lot about pregnancy through being a birth and postpartum doula, I know that there's a lot that you can either switch on or off going into pregnancy epigenetically wise. I can't get into the details because that's not my thing. But I wanted to try with my best ability to give my babies the best chance they have at health and like the positive mentality and anything that I could. So I went hard. (laughs) I had gotten the best shape of my life before my first pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then I got a job sitting in a pediatrician's office and sitting isn't good anyways. But then you add the weight and the change and all the relaxin adding into your body. And actually, when we'd have late nights, I would do my split squats <laughs> and tib raises and FHL cap raises because no one came through the front. I just had to answer the phone when it rang. So I would start doing all of this. And anytime I had hip pain or knee pain or <laughs> any kind of pain, my husband would just adjust what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And... I got through my first pregnancy without any lingering pain, anything that put me out, anything that really just changed the way that I could look at that pregnancy. And I thought to myself, I love it. I love pregnancy. I know a lot of women, it's not their favorite time. So if I can help them get through their pregnancy without pain, with lessening the pain, (laughs) anything that can make it a little bit better so that they can feel good in their bodies as their bodies are changing in ways that you just can't, you can't experience any other way. So I really went after my probably about eight weeks postpartum 
and started reading a lot about more into the pelvic floor therapy side, which I ended up seeing a pelvic floor therapist, which in other countries they do no matter what. So it should come as an option for so many women, but so many women don't think that it's bad enough or it's almost this shameful thing if you should Mm -hmm. go see them. And it's something that can literally change how you live the rest of your life if there is an issue there. So I added that into my protocol. Some of the stuff I learned from them, I talked to my midwife and said, okay, by trimester, what's important? What do you need to hit? What do you need to kind of forget about? (laughs) Because sometimes you just want to go all in and you can end up doing some damage. So with their expertise, my expertise in the ATG side, I just created the protocol and have worked about the last two years on it. (laughs) And I started it again with this pregnancy on myself and had other coaches use it with their clients. And it's something that I'm so proud of and excited about. And I think it can really make a big difference. Yeah, that's awesome. I know know it is and I know it will continue to be. Uh, For everybody out there listening, when she says she's an ATG coach, it's a company or a company slash program called Athletic Truth Group. And it was founded by a guy named Ben Patrick on and on Instagram. He's known as Knees Over Toes Guy. And a lot of my listeners and my clients will will know what that means. Um, but give me a little bit of, you talked about how in your first pregnancy you did, your husband had you doing things to allevi- alleviate knee pain and any kind of pain. And give us some of those exercises and, and the description of some of those exercises. Like people who are listening who are my clients know what like tibia raises are, but some people who, a lot of people who are listening who are not my personal clients don't. So give us some of those exercises that you did to help manage and alleviate or remove any of that pain and with with some kind of brief descriptions and and why those are good exercises to do, especially during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of times we want to go big and we think that bigger is better. But if we're not starting from the tendons and ligaments as your body is growing and changing, and I've mentioned relaxin that is released in your body during pregnancy. Mm. So what relaxin does is it allows your body as it needs to, to expand and your pelvic bowl to kind of loosen up in order to let the baby eventually come down. But when you're working out, if you're not aware of that, you can all of a sudden you are getting deeper into your squats. You're getting deeper into your split squat. So imagine doing lunges. All of a sudden, you're going way deeper. And you're thinking, this is great. But if you're not aware that that happens in pregnancy, the next day you're going to wake up and you're going to not be able to move. Mm. So you have to be aware of that moving into these. So you want to start from the ground up. So like tib raises. You want to find a wall, put your booty against the wall, and just pull your toes up. Put them down pull them up. And that is going to strengthen everything below where we want to focus on usually because you want to do the big movements. Everything is adding weight below your waist, really everywhere, but especially below your waist. So as your body is growing a person, you're going to want to focus on everything, ankles, knees, hips, everything coming up. So really starting from the ground, especially in your first trimester, if you're feeling sick, it's a low impact movement that you can do and see huge results. Another thing is different calf raises. So you want to make sure that you're addressing both the lower calf and the upper calf. A lot of times we just hit the upper calf and the lower calf gets left behind and you end up straining something back there. And you end up getting pain near the back. If you know where your Achilles tendon is, kind of behind your ankle bone. So all of those things you want to strengthen. And you can do it with these tiny movements. But until you do them, you'll be like, oh, that's easy. And then you start doing them. And you're like, okay, that's a little bit more difficult than I thought. And so you want to still do the squats and everything like that. But if you're getting weaker below your knees... You're not going to be able to support all of the big movements. 
So even the tiniest things that you can add in are going to make a huge difference. So I did a lot of those starting when, especially when I was in pain, because I could do all of it without feeling any pain. And that's what you want to do anyways. I love it. So basically starting from the ground up getting, like you said, the tibia raises, which is where your shins are, that muscle and strengthening the ankles and then calf raises, making sure that you hit lower and the upper calves. Um, let's, let's dive into the kind of the specificity, a little bit of the trimesters, because I know that you've you talk probably a lot about that in your program. Um, talk to us about like, what are the differences from trimester to trimester f- through the lens of like, what exercises you should do, what exercises you shouldn't do, and kind of how that progresses across the, the nine months. Yeah. So in the first trimester, it's so hard because everyone experiences their trimester differently. So I set it up if you can only do the first like tib raises and calf raises and walking backward and that's all you can hit, it's going to make a big change. So I always put those first at the beginning. And then I do the movements like squats because squats you're going to want throughout your whole pregnancy. And you're especially going to want like back extensions so that your back body is getting strong to compensate for what's growing in front of you. So those are the kinds of things that go throughout the whole pregnancy. But we start small in the first trimester. And what's nice is it's scalable. So you can do, you can add weights or just use your body weight. And the big things really in the first trimester, you have a little more range of movement because you don't have as big of a belly. So you're getting further down on your back extensions than you can once your belly gets a bit bigger. We're doing things like seated good mornings that you will eventually move off of the front of your bench so that your belly has this space. But a lot of those movements that are based towards the backside are things that you're going to want to keep up. So we do see the good mornings in the first and second trimester. But in the second trimester, we add in Romanian deadlifts. So Mm -hmm. instead of your body being supported by a bench, you've now got some of the strength to support your own body by standing with the Romanian deadlifts. So things like that. And then the pelvic floor therapy work, it it gets harder. And I've got to say, there's certain movements that are not my favorite, but they're so important. And they're not my favorite, not because they're not wonderful, but because they're so hard. Yeah. It frustrates me. And it's like such small movements that makes it difficult. So if anyone does it and they're just like, Mm-mm, this is not fun, no one thinks it's fun and it's okay. <laughs> So on in the first trimester, you're doing it from your back. After your first trimester, you want to be on your hands and knees so that you don't have the pressure of your belly of the baby on your other organs. So that's how we flip that side. So you're still working more advanced movements with your pelvic floor therapy work, but it's all going to be progressively harder. Whereas your second trimester is probably going to be the most intense with weight and number of reps and then your third trimester you're also doing the big movements like the squats you're doing the pelvic floor therapy exercises but you're going to kind of step back a little bit because your body is one filled with the most relaxing and two is going to be getting to the biggest it's going to be so it's going to take more energy and you're going to have less lung capacity pretty much So it kind of ramps itself up to the second trimester. You hit it a little bit harder in the second trimester and it goes down a little bit in the third trimester, but still working all the squats and everything like that. So that when it comes to push that baby out, you've got all of that muscle and you can get into that position comfortably because it might take six pushes, might take two hours. You just never know what's going to happen. So we're going to get you ready so that if you're in that squat for a long period of time, you can stay in that squat for a long period of time. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And to try to do as best as I can kind of regurgitate a little from trimester by trimester and feel free to uh, correct me where, where it needs to be corrected. So things like squats, back extensions, the tibia raises, the calf raises, the walking backwards, like that stuff is things you can do the entire uh, the entire term of your pregnancy, but however, sometimes it just varies by range of motion and or intensity or or load. In the first trimester, you're going to be able to get more range of motion, and depending on where you're coming from, probably from a fitness background, 
you want to decrease or have no load or, or increase or have no load depending on kind of where you're coming from and like you said adjust the movement based on how your be- your belly is growing and you can do pelvic floor exercises from your back then as you go into the second trimester you want to adjust the exercises based off of again the size of your belly so you can get good range of motion and now doing things like romanian deadlifts then making sure the pelvic floor exercises go to your hands and knees but this is when you can maybe really push yourself from a weights and a rep standpoint, because maybe you're not feeling as bad during your second trimester and you're not to the point where you're even bigger, where it would really take a lot out of you. And so in that third trimester, it's still the same exercises. However, you just maybe dial back the overall intensity of it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Let's, I, w- I want to ask a question about some of the things that I've just heard to, I've heard variable approaches from clients of mine their doctors and such what is your approach on elevating your heart rate when and when in the middle of a pregnancy and again maybe that varies trimester by trimester but give me some of your thoughts and 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 knowledge on that yeah so you have to take into consideration if the person is already an athlete Mm -hmm. (laughs) if they're running they're going to have hitting those higher outcomes anyways If they're someone that for the first time they've realized I'm pregnant, I haven't worked out, I want to change my lifestyle so that I can do something better for this baby, then you're probably going to have to scale it back a little bit. But as long as they're not high risk and the doctor doesn't say, okay, we have to really monitor this, it has a bigger range than what people imagine or think. And I'm sure you've heard this and I'm sure that some doctors out there, thank you doctors, but they say you cannot lift over 10 pounds when you are pregnant. I'm sorry, my toddler is 28 pounds. (laughs) So that just throws that out. And that's just something that's very outdated and isn't actually helpful. So you have a lot of women that come in with the fear of it saying, okay, this is what my doctor said. And you kind of have to work with them. So just explaining to them, one, we aren't going to ever move into pain. If you are getting that elevated heart rate, you get that pain in your, in your chest, you get a pain in your side, you get a pain in your back, like we're tapped out. So we're going to take it down. So you really have to monitor each person a little bit differently, which is so hard. And you know, this with fitness, you want a one size fits all answer a lot of times, but as different as your children are, (laughs) it's going to be different with each client. And some people are going to be coming through and you're going to have to tell them like, okay, I saw that face you made. I'm going to, I'm going to step you down because they'll be like, it's fine. And I'm like, okay. So just opening up that communication and really asking the woman, like, what do you feel in your body right now? Because that's going to change what you're going to tell them that they can and can't do. So with the heart rate itself, unless there is some medical necessity, I don't watch that as much. I watch different pains in their bodies. Mm. So it can show up anywhere. (laughs) Doesn't matter where it is. If they're getting any pain, we step down. And then I always check back on what we've done before, made sure that what we did was fine, and then go from there. Gotcha. Yeah, I I think the thing that a lot more doctors or at least that I'm hearing from from clients and such is that so much does depend on where you're coming from when you're entering into your pregnancy like if you are coming from a place of working out a lot and running and strength training then you can largely continue to do a lot of the things that you've been doing um but if you're coming from a place of, of not maybe you, you don't want to overdo it too much in a lot of those areas so I think that's really important for a lot of people to kind of take that knowledge and apply it to themselves um appropriately We're going to take a brief pause in this episode to tell you about our brand new, never seen before, best in class virtual 10 week transformation experience. You can check it out today by going to nickcarrier.com. Now, look, if you're somebody who needs accountability to execute on a consistent basis with eating healthy and exercise, this virtual 10 WT experience is for you. If you're somebody who is upset with themselves when they look at themselves in the mirror, not just physically, but also emotionally and mentally, then the 10-week transformation is for you. If you're somebody who kind of knows what to do, but 
you struggle to actually do it, the 10-week transformation is for you. If you're somebody who loves community and loves support and loves being held accountable, the 10-week transformation is for you. With the 10WT, we teach people how to form the healthy habits that will transform their body and their life. And now we have a brand new, robust version of the program that can be completed from your home, your gym, or your anywhere. I mean, whether you live in Nashville or San Francisco, Atlanta or New York City, Houston or Denver, LA or Chicago, Sydney, Australia, or Toronto, Canada, you can even complete this thing in your hotel room. Our brand new virtual 10WT experience is like nothing you've ever seen before. We've had 453 people and counting who have skyrocketed their self-confidence by losing fat, building muscle, and building habits that they now have ingrained in their lifestyles by completing the 10WT, and it can do the same for you. Starting August 7th, we're going to be coaching a group of 30 go-getters through their first ever 10WT experience, and you have the opportunity to be one of the first but there are limited spots available. Like I said, there are 30 spots and they're going to go fast. So sign up by Tuesday, August 1st to secure your spot by going to nickcarrier.com. Again, by August 1st, go to nickcarrier.com. Again, if you need a greater level of accountability, the 10WT is for you. If you need help staying consistent with your workouts and eating habits, the 10WT is for you. If you want to form healthy habits going into holiday season, the 10WT is for you. Remember, sign up by August 1st. To secure your spot, there are only 30 available by going to nickcarrier.com. When you join, I promise you, be prepared to show the world the healthiest, most confident, and best version of you. Go to nickcarrier.com to sign up today. One of the things I'm curious about now that you're, you have a toddler and you're also pregnant, what are some of the different things that you do to, and this is, this could be like from a time management standpoint, um, and from like a technical exercise standpoint, well, what are some of the things that you do in order to stay fit and stay healthy while you have to manage a little one and carry a little one? Yes. Well, one of the things that is so important to me is words are easy. What you do is going to actually change what they see and what they pick up in their lives. So when I was feeling more sick at the beginning, I would work out a little bit more when she was napping just so that I didn't have to do that management. So on the days where all I could do was backward walking, I would do it when she was napping. Mm -hmm. But besides that, I bring her in and I let her try to do, she picks up, she has a little three pound weight and she tries to do like her tricep extensions, but her hands only come this high because her arms are so short. So even that, and she does squats with me. So I try to include her in everything that I'm doing so that she's learning. It's not a punishment. It's not something to get my body into submission so that I can act act a certain way, look a certain way, have this appearance out in the world. But it's just a part of, it's what we do as a family. So my Mm -hmm. husband will come out, he'll work out. She'll be there doing everything that we can. And sometimes that means I stop in the middle and I bounce on the yoga ball because she wants to jump on the yoga ball. So it's just giving yourself the grace that sometimes it's not going to look perfect. (laughs) And by sometimes I mean more often than not, it's not going to look perfect. But just showing up is going to make the biggest difference in her life. And then that's going to be something that I take. And I'm like, okay, I feel good about that because she's learning this is what we do because we want to feel good and be able to do the things that we do as a family. Yeah. I think that's great. I think I love how you talk about it from the sense of it's not about exercising and probably when she gets older too, it's not about exercising and eating to look a certain way. It's about exercising and eating because this is just what we do. And this is how we want to be able to feel and the things that we want to be able to perform and do certain things like that. I think that's great. And what you said is so key for so many mothers out there at different stages of their life, whether they have toddlers or not toddlers, is like your definition of success of what fitness looks like, like be okay with it being malleable and adaptable based off of the season of life that you're in. And so many times people don't give themselves that grace. They think it needs to look a certain way because that's how it used to look, but it's not always going to look that way. And so that realization and acknowledgement is super, is super critical. Yeah. And I was working out seven days a week before I got pregnant and there were weeks where I worked out maybe one day and my, in the first trimester. And that was, I walked backward. So Mm -hmm. I'm giving everyone that grace that you can go from seven days 
it's not worth it to punish your body. You, your body is going through the most incredible thing that it can. It's going to take so much out of you and it's going to be different from pregnancy to pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So especially if you have other kids, do you want them to learn the lesson of when you feel terrible, you have to do it anyways, because that's what I expect of you. Because what you put on yourself will come onto your children. So I want my daughter and whatever this baby is to grow up learning that they're going to be loved, whether they show up and work out every day, whether they get it right, if they have a good attitude all the time, because we don't, (laughs) I don't have a good attitude all the time. So giving yourself the same grace you would give your children, that is going to be like such a load off and it will take so much stress off this growing little person that's in there because they feel everything that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. They feel all of those expectations, those unmet wants. They're going to have such a better time inside of you if you can just give yourself so much grace, so much grace. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, No doubt about it. To to dive back into your story a little bit, are there any... I don't know if the word mistakes is exactly what I'm going for, but there are there any mistakes that you made in your first pregnancy that you're that you are doing differently now, or just maybe things that you did differently in the first one compared to this one? Yes, <laughs> I punished myself uh, mentally a lot more mm-hmm. on the first. I didn't give myself that grace that I talk about, <laughs> so I, I'm saying this from a standpoint of I was there, and there were times when I would sit with my husband at night and he would come in and be like, Hey, you good. And I would just like cry. Cause I'm just like, I didn't get this and I didn't do this with my body. And I didn't, and he helped me a lot. Give me the, myself the grace of like, okay, well, what did you do? Okay. So you did that and you made some eyeballs today. Like <laughs> it, it will be okay. Today isn't forever. And I think sometimes we get lost in that thought that Whatever happens in this moment is going to change everything, but you can always change tomorrow. So Mm -hmm. even when I felt a little bit sick, I would do it, but I wouldn't push myself like I did in the first trimester because I definitely would push myself into getting nauseous in like a way that wasn't (laughs) from my pregnancy. It was because I was coming from a less than thought about what I was doing. And I dropped that this time. I allowed myself to just grow a person when I needed to just grow a person. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Anything like anything exercise wise that you did too much of in the first one, or maybe you're like, this really helped a lot of the first first one. I want to do it more in the second one or anything like that. I think back extensions, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm adding them in more often now. And just making sure that everything in the back is getting stronger. So doing those, doing trap three raises to get the full trap, because we just think they're up here where we keep our stress, most of us, but it actually goes down deep into your back. So really focusing on getting the back body as strong as possible. And I love seated good mornings. I could do them every day, all day. And so adding those in, it's something that I enjoy doing. And something that's going to benefit me throughout the whole pregnancy. So doing a lot more for the backside of my body. Because I think the first time I did the squats, I did split squats. I did all those things and didn't focus on the fact that it was going to take such a toll with the weight added in the front. So Mm -hmm. really focusing on my back has made a huge difference so far. I mean, I haven't gotten the full, full belly, but... That it has been the biggest change that I've made yeah. this pregnancy. Awesome, and, and I've you've mentioned a number of. We've talked about a number of the different pains that are common during pregnancy, but like maybe ankle pain, knee pain, hip pain, back pain, or those kind of the usually the main sciatic. ones. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm like specifically <laughs> just sciatic pain. Yeah, I I dealt with that from picking up my daughter already, and I. I got lazy with my movement and I just would bend down and pick her up. Mm. You can't do that. (laughs) Like you've got to respect the way that your body's put together and the fact that you're picking up an almost 30 pound little person. 
And so I had to take a step back and back extensions, elephant walks for people that don't know what that is, putting your hands on either a brick or on the floor if you can, bending both legs and straightening one at a time made a huge difference. Couch stretch, um, just really going and putting that back in took all the sciatic pain away. So Mm -hmm. readdressing things when it pops up is so paramount. Yeah. That people can people can look this up, but two different ones I want you to just try to verbally describe as best you can without doing it. Uh couch stretch and then a elevated pigeon pose and why those are important. Mm-hmm. So um, I like the elevated pigeon pose. Let's go to that one first. I think it's so if you have a bench that can incline, you want to put your leg that is closest to the incline up in like not quite a 90 degree angle but pretty close and you can do a few different things you can just hold that stretch with your other leg straight out behind you or if you can't even put your leg straight out behind you you can bring that leg in if that's what you need you can hold it static you can pulse your head towards the knee right in the center or towards your ankle so It's really going to, the thing that's nice about stretching under tension is that when you just do stretching, it kind of jumps back to where it was once you stop. But if you're adding some weight and some extra tension to that, it's going to strengthen it as well as elongate everything that you're stretching out. So I actually did, didn't think about it, but I did do this for (laughs) my sciatic pain Mm -hmm. and, um, You want to do it probably about 30 seconds each side. And it's really going to get into that back hip, really start to open up in throughout your full leg. Again, it depends upon how deep you can go into it and where you're putting your head. So it's going to hit a little bit different. If you put your head up towards your knee, you're going to feel it a little bit differently. So anytime you feel any sort of pain in it, you do not want to go any further you want to go back in it but that's going to hit all of your sitting muscles <laughs> so the same with couch stretch it hits anything that is in your hip flexors that's in that lower back region that's connecting down into your knee because once you've i'm sure learned if you have a knee pain all of a sudden the opposite hip is going to start compensating so it's going to work everything from your ankles all the way into that lower back the couch stretch like you can literally do it on a couch which is how i learned it the first time (laughs) but if you're doing it against the wall i'm like okay how do you explain this i've never had to explain it without showing someone yeah um if you can put one leg bent okay how would you explain how you can get into a couch stretch yeah i mean it's it's hard you're kind of your facing away from a wall, you're kneeling down, then you take one foot, elevate it behind your butt, and try to get it to the point where it's kind of like against that wall when your other foot is out in front on the floor. It's it's, it's, it's tough to describe that. I mean, hopefully that gives you maybe a little bit of a picture, but you can go follow Amy on Instagram, and she's got videos of that. You can also probably just look it up, but couch stretch... And elevated pigeon pose are two really great ones um, that you can do, and, and that's perfect to help with sciatica pain and so many different other types of pain as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to get into before we finished up is kind of like getting back into exercise post-pregnancy slash like how to bounce back quickly as possible. I feel like probably how to get back into it and how to bounce back quickly is often determined by what you do during your pregnancy, but I'm going to c- kind of let you riff off of the idea of like, how do we, how does somebody bounce back quickly after exercise or after pregnancy? Mm -hmm. Okay. One thing I'm going to do, and I'm not saying this against you personally, but the idea of bouncing back, I have a hard time with. So the reason is once you have a baby, your body will never be the same. Mm. You can have it look very similar, but you grew a person, you got them outside your body. The goal isn't to be who you were before you had this person. Like it is life transforming to have a 
a baby grow inside of you. And then whichever method ends up happening, get them on the outside. So I would challenge you and other people to really accept that your body is different. It's never going to be what it was. And not only is it okay, but you've gone through something that is one of the most incredible, like sacred experiences that a person can go through. So a couple things. Relaxing does not fully leave your body for nine months. It takes nine months to peak. It takes another nine months to leave your body. You also have your baby and the placenta leaves a wound in your uterus the size of a plate, a dinner plate. (laughs) So that's something that's going to take a while to fully get down. For, I challenge people at least two weeks, but ideally for about six weeks, you want to keep your legs together as much as humanly possible. And in the first two weeks, you want to get out of bed as little as possible. And so if you are one of those women that you can start walking at four weeks. I thought that I was doing great. And I start. I went on probably a mile walk with my husband and he held the baby because I knew I shouldn't hold the, even the extra almost seven pounds. And I came back and the bleeding I had after pregnancy came right back and more. So my body was like, you think you know better and still you did it. So I had to go back and go after my six week rule and really hold myself to a little walks in our garage and really let my body do the healing that it takes. And then from there, I start with walks without holding a baby. (laughs) And then I would hold my daughter and I would just walk and do things like the tib raises, calf raises, really small, and then look at my body for clues. So if I had any more bleeding coming back, I had to nix what I had added on. And everyone is going to be a little bit different, especially if like you are a C-section mommy, that is going to be a different recovery than if you had a vaginal birth. So my pretty much six weeks is like your sacred six weeks that you really have to just give your body everything that it needs nourish it with good food, with water, with rest, let the people in your life want to come and take care of you and the baby. And from there, you can start very slowly and then always tune back in with your body. And then you can add all the things that you've done as your body is giving you positive feedback. So again, not a one size fits all answer and changing a little bit of it, but I totally encourage when I used to have, um, birth clients as a doula, I would tell them you're a mermaid, keep your legs together, stay in your bed, let everyone come to you. (laughs) So that's kind of how I do it now for my clients. I'm like, well, if you can take a little walk, great. If not take a nap, (laughs) you know? Yeah, that's great. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you, uh, addressing the words of bouncing back not quite being not quite being the the right way to think about it because you're not bouncing back to what you used to be or there's going to be a new a new you completely so um i appreciate you pointing that out as well before i ask the last question here uh, amy i just want to acknowledge you for essentially going through this experience and then coming up with a way to treat the future version of yourself and also the past version of yourself so that you can go through this very special and unique period of time of your life in a and as smoothly smooth of a manner as possible and help others do the same because I know this is a time of people's lives where there's so much uncertainty there's so much fear there's there's stress there's anxiety there's a lot of expectations that you put on yourself uh, and stress that you put on yourself and so it's just a lot it's just a tough emotional time physical time everything uh, every everything about it is tough, and for you to be able to play such a pivotal role in people's lives to make it as manageable and as hopefully painless as possible, um, it's something special. Thank you so much. It's an honor to step into this sacred area with as many people as I can. I just want to help them in any way that I can with my knowledge I've put out there. Yeah. 
I love it. Well, I'm going to have the link to your course in the show notes, but it's called the Pregnancy Protocol. Uh, you can also follow Amy on Instagram at underscore Amy Hughes underscore. Again, we'll have that linked up in the show notes. But is there any other good place that people should go learn more about you and go to support you? I really, with my daughter, I keep it pretty simple to Instagram. And then what I'm going to put pregnancy, eventually I'll have a postpartum um, protocol put up after there, but I really want to make it as, as good as I could do for the pregnancy protocol. I want to do for postpartum. So I am not into getting myself out there as much as really making it as good and compact and simple and accessible to everyone. So those two are the two spots to get me at this point. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, last question here, Amy, and I'm going to, I want to phrase it this way. If there is somebody who is going into pregnancy for the first time they're maybe they just found out or found out a week or two ago and they're pretty health conscious, what are three things that you would tell them in order to navigate this process as fluidly, as smoothly, as, I don't think, I don't think pain-free is the right word, but as pain-free as possible. And again, this could be, the three things could be mindset, it could be practical, it could be emotional, just three things that you would tell somebody who maybe just has recently found out that they're pregnant for the first time. I would tell them, number one, no horror stories. When people get pregnant, they love to tell you their horror stories and you have enough going on. So I would give them permission if someone starts to go down that, that path to say, Hey, I appreciate your experience. Your experience is not my experience and I'm not allowing those, those kinds of stories in my head. So that's my number one all around. No horror stories. Number two, do not let yourself get hungry and hit it with protein. It's in my first pregnancy for the first 13 weeks, I pretty much ate Ezekiel raisin bread with butter and frozen blueberries. And I was very sick. <laughs> and obviously every pregnancy is different, but this time I really made myself eat protein, eat, get eggs, get things that eventually you might get turned off from, but some kind of protein, cheese and crackers, something that's going to offset the nausea and it doesn't make sense in your head, do not get hungry. That that is like the worst thing. And two, don't keep your thoughts inside because there are a lot of stories you're going to tell yourself. There are a lot of things you're going to hear from other people. And so either tell someone that is your partner or a close friend, a parent, someone that you can trust. And sometimes you don't need their feedback. You just need to get all of the, like the gunk out of your head and to piggyback on that one, move your body. <laughs> yeah. so I'm like, you have yeah. to have movement in there, but so much of what's coming at you is mental that mm-hmm. the mindset is going to make a big difference. And keeping the fear inside isn't going to help you. It's not going to help the baby. It's not going to help anything. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, there was so many, so much great stuff in here, guys, with specific exercises to do, when to do them, how, when to scale back, and 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 what version of them you need to do at what times, how to relieve different kinds of pain, how to go about this, how to navigate it from like an emotional standpoint and an expectation on yourself standpoint. So just so many great things. Make sure you go follow Amy on Instagram. Make sure you check out the pregnancy protocol if that applies to you at this season of your life. And uh, yeah, Amy, that's all we got. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. 